Hello, Blenders, and welcome, welcome to episode number 264 of Real Blend, a podcast that won't ever retire, we'll just reload. My name is Sean O'Connell, I'm the managing editor at Cinema Blend, and on this week's show, as if you can't tell from the jersey that I'm wearing, and you have to go to the YouTube channel to understand what that is, it is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse week. Uh, We have a whole host of content coming your way, including an exclusive sit-down conversation with Phil Lord and Chris Miller talking about all things into and across and a little bit of beyond uh, the Spider-Verse. Um, so let me introduce the boys, because there's a lot to get to. And I will start with Kevin McCarthy of Fox 5 in Washington, D.C. Hello, Kevin. How are you, sir? Hello, Sean, Jacob, Gabriel. Great to see you guys. And uh, yeah, I'm excited about this week. Phil and Chris are amazing. It's so good to have them on. Returning guests, by the yeah. way. Yeah. And the last time they were on, which I'm going to plug, go back and find it. It was for the after party. They're terrific uh, Apple TV show, and we surprised them with a guest <laughs> that I won't that's mention right. because, in case you're listening to it for the first time, I want you to be surprised by the guest as well, too. So that's right. Bill and Chris on the Real Blend podcast talking after party. Uh, Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago is also here as well. You might recognize him from his multiple uh, quotes in the various across the Spider Verse trailers that don't annoy me at all. What um, are, our quotes are often touching. What are you talking about? No, for the most part, like in some of these ones, you get like four out of the out of the four quotes and uh brendan uh paused it one when we were watching one of the nba games and he goes hey hey look and i said yeah i know i know friend yeah did, so did you have like a spielberg moment you're like he didn't get him <laughs> no i had to be very happy for you getting uh, you know, showcased I'm, 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 appreciate you. I'm looking at your jersey and I, yes. i'm thinking back to like all of the spider-man and marvel and dc t-shirts and everything you own and yeah. do you think like michelle ever does the laundry and just sighs deeply yes oh absolutely <laughs> yes 100 percent I told you when we were at the New Beverly for the book signing and everybody was showing up for Spider-Man 2, everybody was all the fans were coming in with Spider-Man T-shirts and gear. And I was commenting on everyone's shirts because I see a lot of new ones. And Michelle looks around and she goes, it just looks like your closet in here. (laughs) (laughs) And she didn't mean that in a good way. No, she didn't. Uh, No, I wear an abundance of this is like my bit, though. Right. Like I've committed to the bit of wearing super. How many Spider-Man shirts do you think you own? Oh, my God um okay Carl. are there more spider-man shirts or more spider-man movies shirts oh shirts. Oh, without oh. a question yeah shirts um i probably have like 10 but i've recycled a bunch over the years i get them and i wear them and then they turn into like pajama shirts because they wear out they stretch out and thing and then after then they just have to be removed <laughs> <laughs> there's a tear there's a tear spot. <laughs> uh, Gabe Kovach is sitting in the producer's chair as well too hello Gabriel how are you sir I am fantastic I am seeing the movie that we're talking all about this week and a lot next week as folks will find out in a number yes. of hours so I couldn't be more excited and he's going to take his uh, headphones out in case we get into specific details but we won't we're going to dance spoiler free this week spoiler free this, this week. week yes we are including our convo with Phil and Chris which you guys can listen to in full so if you're watching us on YouTube first off hello there Good to see you guys. Um, we really appreciate you guys coming to the channel to watch the show on uh, Fridays, usually or throughout the weekend. And if you guys want to wait until after you've seen Spider-Verse this time, we totally understand. If you're joining us for the very first time, head down, give us a like and a subscribe. Uh, tell friends about the channel. This is a really fun way to spread the word of Real Blend. Uh, and of course, if you don't want to watch spread the video the format, Real Blend. And also, yeah, I keep posting those photos on Fridays when you guys watch it on your televisions. I oh, love that's those. fun. Yeah, that's always a lot of fun when people that are the best. Uh, watching the show and uh, uh, our giant heads are on their TV screens. Uh, of course, <laughs> we're available everywhere you get your podcast needs met. I want to let you guys know we do have some exciting news, some updates uh, for the show that uh, if you tune in every week to listen to Real Blend on the regular, you are going to want to stay tuned until the very end of the show to hear more about these updates. We're going to go through the normal bits of the show, and then we'll give you guys that update um, about Real Blend in a little while. You'll be excited Wait, is to it, is this. Wait, is this the one where we're announcing Christopher Nolan's taking over as a co-host? He, he's uh, just him by himself. You yeah. jumped the gun. It's oh, actually, it's actually, it's actually for the rest of the year. It's just him and Greta Gerwig doing a movie podcast <laughs> on this on our feeds. That's it. I would Could watch. I'd listen and listen. Yeah, oh, I would yeah. listen. I really would really gladly know what the listen. Furious rankings are. <laughs> oh, that's oh, where we're episode they, one. They do it's just all us. Yeah. Moderated by Tarantino. Moderated by Tarantino. Uh, until those two come around for their show, uh, you get us <laughs> talking to Phil and Chris. Mil- uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller about all things across the Spider Verse. This week's interview, yes, Jake. 
Have we done a Spider-Man tier list? I don't think we've done a specific Spider-Man tier list, though. I think we've only done Spider-Man in the MCU tier list. Yeah, I think. The, oh. I think. I think Batman's Ooh. the only character that we've done. Really? That doesn't seem I'll right. go back and double check, but I, I don't know okay. that we've done Spider-Man solo. I need to go back and listen to the Batman one. I'm sitting here thinking, when did we do Batman? Batman you know, there, good. We, did that, we did that for the Batman. There are three negative Across the Spider-Verse reviews at this moment. Like, can you imagine sitting down for that movie and coming out of it and being like, hmm. Eh, didn't work yeah, for me. I'll give it a green no spot. Idea. <laughs> All right. Anyway, let's That's get to the guys who are movie. semi-responsible for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse in addition to an enormous creative team. But at the, at the head of that snake is Phil Lord and Chris Miller, and they are joining us on the Real Blend podcast. He said they wanted to be watching it with me in that uh, message. Gavin. I thought it was for me. Okay. It was private yeah. for each. Guys, don't share our private conversations with one another. Well, they, they specifically <laughs> called me and they're like, hey, we have a message coming up and you're going to think it's for other people, but it's but, for but you. It's just Actually, for you. Secretly yeah. just for you. Yeah. Uh, guys, we have not literally not stopped talking about this movie since we saw it. It is an absolute masterpiece that has mm. floored all of us. That's oh, so fantastic. kind of you to say. I'd love to hear that. We don't Literally. even know what words to use. Like we, we, were, we were texting after the movie was over and I was like, I don't even know how to explain what I just watched because I was telling the guys, it's like a simultaneous thing where you're immersed in the story so much, but your brain, my brain allowed me to also step back and think about what I was visually experiencing, but I never lost touch with the story at the same time. So it was almost as if I was like, I got to think about it in two ways at the same time. It was unbelievable. So congratulations yeah. to you guys. Oh, thank Seriously. you very much. You know, the, the yeah. friend of mine told me that she has already picked out the weed that she will be smoking <laughs> before she goes in. And that that concerns me a little bit, but she seems to know what she's doing. Well, we had a professor in college um, who was uh, definitely a child of the 60s, uh, our animation professor. And I remember he told us once that we didn't need to smoke weed because... You guys are already there. <laughs> <laughs> that's the ultimate compliment. Yeah, yeah. That, it was that's, a compliment. The, that's their secret. They're, yeah, they're just high all the time. That's like, we don't <laughs> we don't smoke pot, and it's I think I don't know because I don't know what it would do. <laughs> <laughs> it ends up making you very normal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um. So we got to start. Uh, there are so many amazing ways that um across the Spider Verse ties into into the Spider-Verse. Um, and they can't be coincidences, the way that certain things lay out. And I won't get into specifics, you know, I'll let people discover them for themselves, but I wanna know how much of Across you guys knew uh, when you were doing Into, and what's one thing that you wish you would put in the first film that might've helped mm, the next two? Wow. Oh gosh. There were a couple of things. Well, obviously we, you know, there's the beat at the end of the first movie. Right. Um, we had to do a bit of retconning. We, there was a little bit of retconning on that as far as, you know, he's older now. And it was, you know, in the first movie, it was still his younger design. Um, we almost, yeah. I tried to talk Chris into yeah. going back into the first mm-hmm. film and, and revising the final shot <laughs> to make Miles look older. Oh, that's funny. And also, <laughs> it's unclear in that final shot. It's Miles dropping into his bed. It's unclear whether he's in his dorm room or, or in his parents' house. And he and we it was his bed from the dorm room so we had to kind of like retcon it into the uh, into his parents uh, apartment we also uh, did a big redesign on captain george stacy who appears very briefly in the first movie but doesn't right. look like the way uh, the character that's voiced mm. by Shea Wagum is in this movie um and yeah i would have given um dr jonathan own a cool beard and hairstyle yes. <laughs> Back in, in his, his brief bagel. cameo uh, that really that really kind of uh, yeah. yeah you see oh, his wait, original oh, look in the in the um, in, in a photograph in his apartment yes hmm. is it coincidence that he gets hit with one of the only breakfast foods that has a hole in the middle of that's it that's definitely not a coincidence that is uh, that is uh, by design <laughs> Yes. Amazing. Yeah, but, but, just, that. just on on Sean's question, how much of uh, of a cross did you know going into uh, on into? Very little, very little. To yeah. be a, for, wow. perfectly honest, the you know we knew that Miguel was going to be the way to uh, get uh, Miles to go. At, oh, we were calling it 
actually into the Spider-Verse because Miles didn't really go into the Spider-Verse <laughs> in the first movie. Uh, that was our sort of temp working title for it. Uh, and, and Dave Callahan uh, had, had done a lot of work on the story. Yes. Um, and in and, and things that are, um, some of which are going to wind up uh, in the next picture at the, at the, the third film in the trilogy. Um, mm-hmm. But Dave did a lot of of work thinking about um, the implications of traveling to other places, um, mm-hmm. and so there was a little bit that we were able to sort of make sure that we were not stepping on in the in the original movie. But but in all honesty, so much of it came after it was finished. Um, guys, I feel like today is the perfect day to ask the question I'm going to ask because 43 years ago today, a movie called The Empire Strikes Back in ah. theaters. <laughs> um, and I feel like any time we ever get the second installment of a series and it's a little bit darker and it ends in such a way that you're screaming at the screen because you're ready for the next one, people automatically go, oh, this is The Empire Strikes Back of this series. <laughs> I'm sort of curious how much uh, you guys sort of think about that comparison anytime there's sort of a darker second film. As Star Wars fans, do you guys think of this as sort of your Empire Strikes Back? And I guess just as film fans, is that just sort of a lazy thing that we say anytime there's a sort of a darker second film we call, it, you know, this is The Empire Strikes Back of this series? It's hard to sort of, you know, you know call yourself an Empire Strikes Back. That's, sort of that, a, that's a little yeah, bit yeah. like calling your own home run. Right. Uh, because that's an, <laughs> it's, it's, a bit, it's, an excellent, it's an excellent film. Uh, you know, that said, I think there is naturally you know, a thing that happens with in sequels where, you know, the character is maturing, the, the protagonist is maturing as the film has to mature with it. And it, if it stays, uh, you know, it has, it has to get more sophisticated uh, by its nature or it, it feels unsatisfying. And so I think... Uh, the film has to grow up too, uh, to a certain degree. And so even the lighting in this film, you know, has um, a, a kind of more sophisticated sheen. The thing about Empire, one of the things that you love is that, you know, it's like it's directed by Irving Kirshner. It has a kind of like art house, like veneer to it, right? Like the lighting, like people walk out of. Uh, light and into shadow and back into mm-hmm. light, like they're not just being followed around by studio lighting all the time. So, mm-hmm. at the granular level, Empire has um, an uh, is a is is reaching for a kind of richness that we were also hoping to mm-hmm. accomplish. And what's interesting is that it, there was uh, the ending of Empire, the sort of hopeful uh, part where uh, uh, Luke gets his new hand and they all stare out into the into the future with a with a bit of hope was a reshoot that they did uh, uh, after yeah. they put the film together um, and you know we went through a similar uh, cycle of like trying to figure out what the right balance of hopefulness and excitement for and 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 for the next film without giving away too much about where it was headed um, mm-hmm. Um, because it, because even though the film ends with some unfinished business, it's ultimately a movie about people coming together. And so the film ends, you know, in a way that um, you 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 watch the formation of, you know, a band. <laughs> right. And and you're also, you know, it's, this film is, you know, the it is the middle of a trilogy, but it has to feel like its own film it has to each character has to have a full arc and miles starts in one place emotionally and ends in a totally different place his parents grow uh gwen and her her dad have a relationship that that grows and um, peter b grows and everybody starts the movie one place and ends another so it has a beginning middle and end and it's its own thing it's just there's a little bit of unfinished business left that uh, needs to get resolved <laughs> yes, so. in the final film <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> I'm curious from this, from just from a marketing perspective, and this is something that we were all texting about as well. So originally this was going to be like a part one, part two, correct? That was kind of like the idea of if I, if I had that correct. And one of the things I find interesting is now with the title not having part one in it and then saying to be continued. Um, I'm just curious from a marketing perspective for general audiences, like going into the movie, do, like do, do they will they know they're watching like a half of the story well, it's, kind that, of leading thing, into it. it. Well, we, we, figured, we were, yeah, go ahead. We figured that it, it, it actually isn't a half of the story. It is a, right. a, a whole story. And as we were putting it together, the film, we were realizing we were trying to jam two movies into one movie. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and we realized that that's not, that this was its own movie. 
that has, as I said, a beginning, middle, and end. And so it felt uh, it felt clearer to say like this is the second film of a trilogy uh, mm-hmm. than to be like, oh, this is a movie that's split in half because at the end of the day, it really wasn't. Um, so that's uh, so part of our job. Yeah. Now is to help people understand that this is the middle film of a trilogy and that there's more to come. So that, like, they don't go, wait a minute. <laughs> At the end. But they also realize that they're, they're, you know, they're not getting just, like, an arbitrary cut point of... And, and we've seen people respond to the, the you know, the, the end of this film. And, they're, and it's an expression of their engagement, you know, that they're so um, locked in to this story that um, they don't want it to end. <laughs> That's how I felt. I, was, I could have watched two and a half more hours. That's a, that's what I was saying. Like when it ended, I'm like, yeah. I need more of it now. Like it was like, that's how I felt. Right. And so listen, there is more to come. And what we hope for is that there will be a roadshow version that has just a, a, a big, a, a, an epic film with an intermission. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my reaction as soon as it ended was uh, re-rack that. Film, I need to watch it again. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm not going anywhere. I'm sitting right here. Um, and part of it is because with everything that's happening on the screen, I feel like I processed, I'll, I'll say 70% of it. That's good. Um, so what's a what's a joke that you guys are so proud of that you're afraid people might miss because of the amount of stuff that's going on? There's so much happening. Uh, There's literally a scene full of jokes <laughs> that you are supposed to miss. <laughs> oh, oh, really? <laughs> when well, Miles walks in and... Oh, everyone, oh, they all quip. There's a it was a room full of spider people quipping about the spot and and you see all of the... <laughs> Uh, the jokes that they're all saying on top of each other. Uh, oh, right, 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 right. Um, but there's, you know, there's a, there's a lot. Uh, like, it's hard to... F- any, every scene has some little thing happening in the background... You know, there's the cre- the creepy smiley guy from the first movie is in this movie also briefly. Um, there's there everybody, you know, it's a massive team and everybody wanted to add something to it and 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 so there, there's just a level of richness that really is rewarded by repeat viewing in yeah. the theater Can, on the also, big screen. There's also <laughs> like there like yeah, if you watch um, uh, Taron Killam's character. Uh, uh, um, Web slinger, yeah, uh, Pat O'Hara, right? <laughs> he's he like. There's a moment where he's in like the background of a shot falling off of his chair when That's Miles right. comes through, and it's <laughs> so funny. <laughs> but I only caught it like the fifth time I watched the shot. And it's now guys- be, it's it's now because of this movie that I know that ATM machine that bl- that that literally blew my mind. I, I've been saying ATM machine all my life, and I'm like, why am I saying the extra M? It already means machine, and then chai tea, and then non bread. I'm like, oh, it's what's all wrong? The same. What am I doing? That's absolutely all Chris Miller's work. Uh, yeah. That was brilliant. That literally every time I see an ATM machine now, I will never forget that line. From the it movie. was your you, note. You, Right. Yeah, I was like, yeah. Well, originally, when Miles was, uh, well, the, the the spot was like, "Where's the ATM machine?" I was like, you know, he's a scientist. I don't know that he would say he would be smart enough to know that the M is for machine. <laughs> and then we were like, "Oh, well, so let's have it." Miles make fun of him for it. Yeah. <laughs> Can you guys reveal one Jeopardy category from the night that Miles co-hosted? Yes, oh. I, I I I wrote them. Uh, <laughs> uh, a sw- swinging in the rain. Uh, 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 hold on. Um, that was like the we love, love a good pun. We swinging love in the rain. Uh, um, arachnidiums. Uh, there's, uh, I'm trying to remember all of them, but they're yeah. It's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I don't want to bring the mood of, of the room down, but one of the things I texted the guys after we saw this was like, damn, I wish Stan Lee could have seen this movie. Mm. Like, there's so many aspects of this movie that I just, I have a, a framed photo with him in my apartment, like eight feet that way. So I, I'm a big Stan Lee fan. Um, what is an aspect of this film that you guys most wish that you could have put in front of him for him to see? And I know he's all over into the Spider-Verse. Is he in across the Spider-Verse at all? You know, we made a choice that it felt a bit macabre. Right. Or exploitive or <laughs> and something. And exploitive to, like, put someone in a movie when they could no longer offer permission. 
So mm. that was just our choice. Um, we every once in a while second guessed it just because we suspected that he would have been delighted. <laughs> Um, you know, but, uh, but in any case, you know, he is all over the movie in many ways. The thing that's extraordinary is that what he and Steve Ditko came up with is so salient and resonant that it has replicated itself. (laughs) It's such a powerful idea that one of these heroes is just as scared and vulnerable and clumsy and silly as any of us are, um, that it's... It's, it's it's resilient enough <laughs> to drive the storylines of a thousand different spider people, right? Mm. And so the variations on it, the variations on a theme are so, I don't know, to me that's so interesting. You know, there's a reason the movie starts with a Jeff Koons art exhibit. And it's because, <laughs> uh, you know, when we were deciding whether to do the first film, you know, we were at uh, the Whitney, which was having a Jeff Koons retrospective. And and one of the things that Jeff does is he'll take, you know, a, a bust of Louis the Fourteenth and like remake it and cast it in chrome. <laughs> right. And in so doing, like creates a new work of art that is referencing the earlier one and including it, but also chopping and screwing it. And that's when we thought, gosh, we can do that with a movie. We can do that with this Spider-Man story. And and uh, so that's our objective is to is to take the work that Stan and Steve did and have it um, be part of this work also. Mm. You know, one of the things I love about this film is you're constantly reminded that that he's just a teenager. Um, and at the end of the day, there's so much going on and so much insanity. But then you have these grounded reminders, literally, where he's grounded uh, uh, because of something that he did. But also, like, there's there's a moment that he has with his mom, which I think was part of the first trailer, where she talks about how, like, the boy, you know, please take care of this boy as he goes out into the world. It's one of the most brilliant emotional sequences I've seen. Just the eyes in that scene are insane. Um, but I want to ask each of you, like, growing up, do you remember a story about being grounded for something you did? Kind of like Miles was. Is there something that comes to mind where you go, oh, yeah, I got grounded for this or I did that or I got time out or punishment? I was grounded for a month oh, yeah? because I was a very good kid. But um, everybody was going to Mitch Vento's New Year's Eve party. <laughs> and Mitch was a returning uh, college student who was throwing a party with, an, uh, with open containers. And my parents had gotten a letter from the school saying, watch out this New Year's Eve. Like, don't let your kids go to open source parties. And and uh, so they t- they said, you can't go. And so I lied and said I was going to see a movie with my cousin. And when she got in the car, I said, she's like, we're not going to the movies, are we? I said, no, we're going to <laughs> Mitch Vento's party. <laughs> and anyway, I'm the worst liar that there is. So uh, the next day, my parents said, we are so proud of you for, you know, following the rules and foregoing Mitch Vento's party. And then I erupted in laughter and the cereal came out of my nose. <laughs> and so that night they were like, you lying sack. <laughs> <You're running laughs> <for a month." laughs> Chris, what about you? I, I, I mean, I had a very that? similar, but not quite as interesting version of that same story where I, was invited to a party, uh, and the only other kid in my grade that was invited to the party was a person that I barely knew, and I told my parents that I needed a ride uh, to his house because we were going to have a hangout together, and they're like, why are you hanging out with this guy, with Nassim Kemis? And I was like, we're friends now. He was so cool. Uh, You're uh, like, you're punching above your weight. Like, what is this? Chris, what is no this? way. What's happening here? Uh, and I got totally busted, and I didn't even get to go to the party. Uh, I got busted before even getting to the party. Oh, but, that's a shame. But I will say, it's a lot like, you know, this movie is a feels like Mile, like Gwen got invited to the party, and he wants to be invited too. Yeah. And so yeah. He, uh, he sort of sneaks out. It goes to the party, and then it doesn't go well. Do you want to know how Mitch Vento's party was? How was it? It was fine. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> was it, was it, wait, was it worth the month grounding? It was definitely not. Uh, and the thing that was interesting is, like, I was only included because I agreed to be the designated driver for <laughs> other, like, I was punching above my weight with the other people that were going. And I just remember, like, driving my, like, gigantic 
you know, old Oldsmobile that my uh, hand me down from my mother through a dr- in, it was Florida. So we have drive throughs <laughs> where you can buy alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is a, this is idea. this is bad. <laughs> uh, and it, but but it is like that. Like Chris came up with the original premise of this <sighs> movie, which is what if there was an awesome party and Gwen got invited and Miles didn't. Yeah. What would it do? That's cool. Cool. Yeah. The Spider Verse is Joe Vento's party. It's Mitch really Vento's party. Mitch. 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 Yeah. Everyone knows yeah. Mitch Vento. Sorry, Mitch. Yeah, I'm glad Mitch Vento is getting Where is Mitch Vento he's now? Back. Now? Yeah, he's back from Syracuse. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I, I, I am hung up on the title of beyond uh the spider verse and knowing that you guys you know can't tell us anything and and likely will deflect i'm just curious what your thoughts are because the animation in this is so genius um and it's staggering how good it is but i think beyond and i think of a mix of live action and animation a sort of who framed Miles Morales type thing. Does that intrigue you guys at all? Or do you think that this is an animated franchise that should stay animated because of the creativity it provides? Well, I think at its core, you know, what's really special about this version of a multiverse is a thing that can't be done in live action, which is that each world is it rendered in a completely different art style and different animation style. And you can feel the hand of a different artist and, and get immersed in that inside of a different painting in each universe. And so yeah. that is what I think this film can do that, that no other uh, multiverse film can do. And uh, I think that that is at the core of what makes this thing special. And I think we would, I don't think we have any interest in, in losing that. That said, anything is possible in the multiverse and, uh, and that's part of the fun of it. Yeah. 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 I would, I, I think what's, I think that's well put. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the wheels turning as you're trying yeah. to figure out what not to tell us. Well, I would only, yeah, look, uh, I mean, for one thing, like, I'm not sure there's, um, uh, you know, obviously we work in both mediums and we're not particularly, um, we don't really distinguish between the two of them in terms of what we put on the page, right? Um, and so I'd say that uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting apart from that is that there is a, a known canon, right, that's expressed yeah. in this movie of like all every known spider, but presumably there is the unknown, <laughs> and and I think that's I think that that's one of the the intellectual ideas underpinning where we're headed. Ooh, all right. Get here now, March. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I, I heard a rumor, uh, and I want to say John Mulaney told this story on a late night show, and I think it was in the IMDb trivia for Into the Spider-Verse, that he was given permission to, when recording Spider-Pig, to just go balls to the wall and just go nuts and do it however he wanted to do it. And for a long time, he recorded a lot of his lines as sort of an R-rated Spider Pig before finally being told, John, this is a PG film. <laughs> I'm sort of curious, uh, what are some of the more insane things that somewhere in the Sony vault you have audio recordings of Spider Pig saying? Oh, <laughs> I mean, I, we should dig some of that stuff up because I think that would be a uh, pretty fun little, a little <laughs> yeah. surprise. There's a couple of four letter words, I think. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't remember any of the specifics of of what it was but i just remember laughing a lot and thinking so little of this is usable <laughs> <laughs> but you know yeah. like when you're recording an actor it's certainly somebody who's as like creative and funny as john like you're you're panning for gold right there's going to be a lot of like silt <laughs> You know what I mean? It's not a it's not a it's not a high yield enterprise. It's like you're trying to find that one surprising thing that nobody uh, would have expected. What was the line that wasn't R rated, but that was it sort of killed the mood though? But it was in the movie for a long time when everyone was saying about how they lost their uncle or their dad, and he said he talked he left- about how he had a relative. That had yeah, been turned the, into bacon. They got electrocuted, right? <laughs> and oh, yeah. it smelled delicious. delicious. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> he got electrocuted. His friend got electrocuted. His, his uncle, and he got electrocuted. And he smelled so delicious. delicious. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. And it was a great joke, but everyone was like, I really wanted to keep it in, but everyone was like, it's killing the What's mood. What's weird is that, like, the, 
<laughs> funny enough, that character didn't like the Spider Ham. Like was his like scores were a little bit right, like right. depressed for a character that was getting a lot of laughs. He was they what they what the audience really wanted from him is to be like real for a just moment of one sincerity. moment, yes. and he was at that moment. It ended up being like saying, you know, you know, sometimes you can't always save everybody. everybody. That's that right. was yes. added because he mm. needed to be not just right. like a punchline instead of the fact that his uncle smelled delicious and he was like, <laughs> isn't it the last shot of of, of him in, into the Spider Verse? Isn't it him eating a hot dog? Yes, it is. It is. <laughs> but in his world, hot dogs are made from humans, so uh, so it's not weird. Fair enough. I, I do. I, I want to mention uh, some other things because I, I again, throughout all the insanity and 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 the incredible visuals and the the, the way you guys balance score and soundtrack is so perfect. Because I feel like at the end of the day, when you're the, you have films that are soundtrack heavy and then you have films that are score heavy, but then when you mix them both together and you have them beautifully working together as you do in this film. It's incredible. But there was a line that really struck me when Miles says to his father, he goes, men of your generation ignore their mental health too long. <laughs> That's uh, a Phil Lord line right there. In, in, in all honesty, like I, I, as somebody who's dealt with depression and anxiety and the, and not being able to speak about mental health for a long time. And then now it's got a lot more destigmatized and people have more conversations about it. It was a really great line just to have a kid say it to his father because now I talk to my dad about mental health a lot more than I did as a kid. So you guys are laughing, but I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Like, does that line mean something to both of you? Like, and, and putting the mental health aspect in there, it, it's just a line that struck me. I loved that line. Well, there's a handful of things in the movie. My mother is a therapist. She's a oh wow PhD ma marriage and family therapist. And uh, so there's a few kind of shout outs uh, to mom. <laughs> and I can't remember where this came from, but we were. We were like, I can't remember. We were just like punching up the scene, I think. No, was, I remember you, you pitched that line. and uh, But it wasn't yeah. to serve any goal no. other than to get a laugh, right? right. Um, but it really resonated. And we were. I was really surprised at how much the audience enjoyed it. <laughs> and I do think yeah. there is a generational difference in how people think about their mental health. And, you know, Chris and I are starting to get on in years. Uh, <laughs> But there we have, you know, that are the, the younger people that work uh, with us and work at our company, like have a, a, just speak about these issues in a much more fluid and well-educated yeah, way. Yeah, there's just like so much less bias uh, against, you know, getting getting help. Uh, and there's so much less of a stigma than there used to be. And it's, it's getting a lot better. And, you know, at yeah. the end of the film, Peter uh, is, you know, asleep, right? Mm -hmm. And he's reading a book. Right, a parenting book that, that I have in my office. And that I, I, I just texted my mom and said, if we were going to leave behind an Easter egg, a book that if people picked it up and read it, it would help them. Right? Wow. wow. Give That's me awesome. a list, right? Yeah, it's how to uh, talk how so kids will listen and listen how so, so kids, kids will talk. talk. And it, oh, really? Yes. And so we came up, we had a list of like three or four books. And we sent it to the art department to mock them up. And like, well, we picked this one because it looked the best. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out to be really thematic because the, you know, in throughout the movie, people are asking each other to listen, yes. right? Like four or five different times. So it felt like a miracle of purpose. <laughs> right. And it's all about parenting and the developing relationships between uh, children and parents and how they both need to evolve together and grow up together. Right. And also like about leadership, right? That like Miguel is leading this big group and some of that leadership means like, you know, it, leadership used to mean laying down the law, right? But, you know, but when like one of the things we've discovered as filmmakers is that filmmaking is really about listening. It's not about telling, and and it means you watch a movie and you listen to the movie with your body. You listen mm -hmm. to the crew members. You're not if you want to um, direct or produce a film because you like being in charge. Definitely get another job. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a collaborative medium. I'll tell you a quick story about that, which is that you know in an early version of the movie, with uh, Pavitra's talk up was very different, and a number of Indian, Indian American, uh, and Indian uh, Canadian, Indian Canadian. Uh, animators uh came, like wrote us an email saying like we think uh pav can be better and more interesting they, okay. just cooler and cooler <laughs> and we were, and so we we like had a zoom with them and like okay tell us what you think i mean obviously you know uh, it would be great to know like how we can how we can make them better and they 
sort of it laid out how they wanted him to be cooler, basically. And so we got together a, a, a group of uh, of Indian and Indian American writers for a roundtable, and we're like, how can we make this guy more aspirational, more like. A, like a real like kid in Bombay today, um, <laughs> and and out of that came a whole different version of his intro and opening, and and he became uh, so much better, and everyone was so much happier, and the the <laughs> fact that you can like listen to your teammates, uh, and and help make something better and more authentic and more interesting and more fun, and he became like a he became a real uh, favorite. It transformed people. the sequence. So the, right. the thing that like wow. you could see that email as a speed bump, right? That's just sort of mm-hmm. like an obstacle, or you can see it as an opportunity for the movie to get better. And and uh, Damn. right. So so and it, it it really did like it turned a sequence that people enjoyed into a sequence that people loved, and not just yeah. Indian people, but everyone. Uh, and and uh, that's the thing about you know this is we're getting a bit off topic, but the thing about like inclusivity is that it is good for the audience. It's good for the film. It makes the movie more entertaining for everyone, <laughs> right? For yeah, everyone, right. and that's and we often say that like people make the punitive case for like DEI, like they need to make the affirmative case, which is like how much better everything gets. <laughs> Yes, yeah, right. right, exactly. Well, and it's an incredible credit to both of you guys that that's your, that's your creative process is that you always are. Thank you for sharing that. It's cool to hear that. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Um, we are completely out of time, but could like, just like your movie, we wish it could have gone another two, <laughs> yeah. two more hours. You guys, you guys really have a special <laughs> film. to discuss. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're yeah. very yeah. grateful yeah. that you feel that Thank way. You. And uh, yeah. it's truly Whenever remarkable. we don't like a movie, we just sort of end the interview and go on with our yeah. day. So we yeah. just want to be saying these things. Game changing, like like I will remember seeing this movie for the first time ever. Always, I wish I could watch it again for the first uh, time, like Sean said. Uh, well, we'll we will I neuralize you after I saw it. <laughs> what did you say? I said I asked after I saw it in theaters. I, I really I asked for a link and was told no oh. <laughs> because, I, because I just want to watch it again. I really want to see it again and be able to like pause it and look at things. Yeah. Well, you guys. thank you very, very much, guys. We really appreciate it, we, and we and we love all of your guys' work. We want to thank Phil Lord and Chris Miller and, of course, our good friends at Sony for hooking those guys up onto the show. Uh, Always love having them on. Hopefully they'll be return guests, especially as we get closer to beyond Um, to let you guys know that we're going to continue all the Across the Spider-Verse love next week when we have the three directors who are responsible for the show. They'll be on the main show Friday, but we also uh, booked a very special guest in uh, composer Daniel Pemberton, who did the music for both Into and Across the Spider-Verse. And this is one of those conversations where when he's in the middle of his first answer, yeah, uh, I texted the real one text thread and I was like, Oh, he's a genius. I didn't yeah. realize oh, is that, exactly. Okay. Is that why you sent that? Because yeah. that wasn't part of the interview. Oh, I, yeah, thought yeah. Like, I thought you were like looking in the mirror. Dude, and just his a, first answer, it goes, his answer wraps, I don't even remember who he was talking about, but it wraps around the concept of like film composition in a way that I was just like, whoa, okay, hold on. We got to really step it's up our so game because this guy is really great. And that, wherever you got this podcast that you're listening to right now or watching, that'll be dropping on Wednesday. Wednesday. All right, so let's get into some box office predictions. We have not done this uh, in a while because there hasn't really been a major movie that is going to theoretically uh, test the type of uh, records that animated films hold, that Spider-Man films hold. Um, and we're seeing some wild... Uh, ranges in terms of different outlets calling what they think Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse is going to earn. Um, Initially, when we started doing prep for this week's episode, uh, we had seen like 80 million as the opening projected weekend. Um, Now, via Box Office Pro, they're putting the opening weekend range uh, anywhere between 95 million and 130 million. And right as we're recording this, a couple of other tweets had just come out. I texted it to oh, you yeah. guys in yeah, the yeah. group. Did um, you say 115? This, yeah, a little bit more of a specific. So this is from Discussing Film. Now they're putting an exact number versus like the range, which is an estimate of $115 million in its domestic opening. Now, here's why that's interesting. As you guys know, the original opening of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse was $35 million domestically. That's what I was just looking up. Is that what they put? $35 million? Yeah, wow. so this would be, according to discussing film, this would be a 70% increase. Now, 
We, we often talk about box office a lot on this show in terms of worldwide versus domestic. Sure. And, you know, a lot of stories that come out about box office use one or the other to, you know, promote how well their film did. A great example recently was Fast and Furious and Little Mermaid. Little Mermaid did really well domestically, didn't have the massive global opening like like a Fast and Furious film did. So the numbers for that uh, box office were heavily domestic in terms of the storytelling about how well Little Mermaid did. Fast and Furious, on the other hand, is a movie that does really well internationally, decent domestically. But when you say Fast and Furious made five hundred and twelve million dollars in its first two weeks or whatever, you would say that's a global number. This number is completely domestic. We're talking but I about. I also think at the same time that Spider-Man across the especially the specifically across the uh, Spider-Verse ones is a global is a global play. I, I know. I, I'm not saying Spider-Man isn't. Spider-Man definitely is a global. Now, what's interesting. So if you look at the numbers, so if you look at. OK, look now, this is where it gets interesting. You either have you you either have movies that are really huge globally and they're heavy international or heavy domestic, like I just gave with the example sure, of Little sure, Mermaid sure. and Fast. Spider-Verse was interesting. So Into the Spider-Verse did 190 domestically, 194 international, basically okay. identical. So 384 okay. worldwide. So to your point, Spider-Man obviously has a global and a large domestic audience. The number that we're talking about, the 115 opening up and the original opening up to 35, that's completely domestic. So this uh, the worldwide on this could be, well, I don't know, 250, 300. I have no idea. It could be. And I also feel with the first one with Into the Spider-Verse, um, it's a movie that more people discovered. I, I mean, a lot of people saw it in theaters, obviously. Later. Those are huge. Netflix. Numbers. I think more people discovered it yeah. after the fact. I think they might have felt yeah. like I didn't I don't really necessarily need to see another Spider-Man movie at this point. It was coming off of like Tom Holland being at his height. You know, of the, he was in the Avengers movies. He had his own movies. And I'm not quite sure people felt the need, despite the positive reviews of being like, I'm not going to go see an animated Spider-Man. Movie. I mean, yeah, but, I, I think people just didn't really know what to make of an animated Spider-Man movie. You know, like, I, I, you know, that may a lot of them, may, especially because I feel like a lot of people grew up with a lot of the animated superheroes being available on, you know, every Saturday morning on TV or, sure. you know, like Mask of the Phantasm, the Batman film, just going straight to VHS. So the idea that something I think for so many years was kind of just handed to a generation superheroes via animation sure now the idea of wait it's going to theaters and for a lot of people i think they had to get over the fact that it wasn't a cash grab and it was more an actual work of art with an incredible story to tell sure and i think maybe the first watershed moment where a lot of people really started taking it seriously was when it won the oscar and uh, yeah, I think, I think I would that, agree. that being a watershed moment. And then, like you said, my dad discovered it on now. I'll never forget my dad. I think I want to say I was like home for Christmas or something. And my dad coming out going, have you seen like that? The animated <laughs> Spider-Man movie? And I was like, yes, yes, dad. Yes, I have. Yes, yeah. I have. But, you know, but that, that, that is fun, though. Like people sort of discovering this thing that, that makes them realize, oh, this, God, this is I, something I want to watch that movie with Keith so bad. Can, Keith, I, can I just sit down and Keith. rewatch it with him at some point? please? Look, look how many Spider-Men there are. <laughs> So I uh, just because you mentioned the worldwide, I thought that was a curious question, Kevin. In China, it's opening up the same day. In China, oh. the first Spider Verse film opened to twenty five point eight million. Wow! And eventually made sixty two total. So okay. if it was within ten million of of domestic, yeah. I'm curious how much of an increase they're going to see there, if at all. I mean, it's a different market, but and what's interesting about that, that could be a back, massive go- worldwide. Oh, it's going to be huge. Well, I mean, again, that's that's the crazy thing. So to Sean's point and to Jake's point, I think what happened with Spider-Verse into Spider-Verse was it, it had a it had a, you know, a rather successful run theatrically. But like you said, I think I think when it hit Netflix, that's when I started hearing people talk about it more um, because it was more accessible. But going to the global d- debate that I was talking about a second ago in terms of like, like looking at Fast X, for example, Fast X has made 113 million domestically, 406 million internationally. Damn. That, okay. That, okay. So, so what you're seeing there is in two a film, weeks. That's two weeks. Jeez. So that's interesting in itself because then if you look at Little Mermaid, I'm looking that up now. Little Mermaid had an interesting way because it was a little heavier. Little Mermaid's the uh, uh, opposite, not as not as gigantic, but 118 domestic as of right now, 78 international. But then when you look at the Spider-Verse numbers, it seems like it's about even as as uh, as Gabe is saying, at least with the first one. So if you're if you're seeing a 70 percent jump 
from the first Spider-Man Spider-Verse film to the second domestically. Yeah. It's got it's going to be it's going to be equal right, to so or more than it's probably I mean Gabe is 300 million that for the far opening? off. I, that worldwide? seems doable to me cuz it looks like it's coming to pretty much every major market. Huge. So let me ask same day. Does it hit a billion? No. no. I think I what think What do you mean so quick to say no? No, I th- I I think that I think Okay, no so way you're, home you're, did. you're not going to get you're not I don't yeah. think you're going to get the families okay. in the way that Mario did and you're not going to get the as great as look we'll talk about reviews later but as great as the movie is you're not going to get the like monumental moment in cinema that gets out the billion dollar audiences like no way home did also I understand what you're saying but let me push back on one thing um you have a generation of kids who have been watching that first movie for five years five years since into the spider-verse came out and okay. I, I mentioned this when when uh, I think I mentioned this on the show because Michelle's in um, elementary education and the kids at her school, their Spider-Man is Miles Morales, which is super cool. It's amazing. And it's been a, a, a steady stream of that movie being replayed over and over again and then getting them into the comics, you know, and reading more about Miles and truly anticipating the next Miles Morales movie you know, versus we're going to introduce you to this new character, you know, so I think you may get more families than than you think. But here's but why. It? Here's why I don't think it. I mean, I, OK, so a couple things to answer the question of will it reach a billion? You have to look, you look at the market, for example, um, right now. And again, I'm not comparing this to Guardians of the Galaxy three, but Guardians of the Galaxy three uh, right now open May 3rd. We're almost a month into release. It's about it's 743 million right now. I'm Damn, assuming it'll. I didn't think I'm it was ass- going to get that to that. That's a huge yeah. hit for Marvel huge but it's not i think it doesn't pass 800 right so it, you know we'll see In on the that days of marvel easily hitting a billion or over right but the question now then True. becomes if you look at the june 23 movie releases so, so right now so as of today so we have june 2nd spider-verse um, has is, two weeks that this is what i was about to say all right so basically okay right now little mermaid's probably going to drop extremely um this weekend i would imagine just because it i, I think it was heavily front loaded I, I think it'll still make a lot of money this weekend but i don't think you know if it was a hundred same audience too it's the family right. audience who are going to go with so the spider-verse I, I think, instead i think spider-verse takes a lot of that audience then you have the following weekend which is transformers, uh, transformers. um that's interesting Okay, I don't think that puts a huge dent in it, but we th- let, let's let's think about that for a second. The following week is the Flash. Yep. Right, June sixteenth. I think then that you, cuts into it. That definitely cuts into it, and then the week after the Flash, you have Secret Invasion, which is a series. Um, no hard feelings. Actually, looking at this release date, because once you get into July, then you start getting into like the you know into Indy and Barbie and Oppenheimer, but that's later in July. And it's older movies, well, Indy, older Indy's skewing June 30th. movies. I mean, it's basically July. Oh, Indy's yeah. June 30th. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. I'm not sure. But let's, I want to use that to transition into our next topic because Kevin's mentioning a, a ton of blockbusters. And we were having this conversation about these movies all stacking up on top of each other now, all of a sudden. And primarily the premium formats. Um, I did see some people complaining on my Twitter feed about... They have to rush out and see Spider-Verse in IMAX or in 4DX uh, this week because by next week it's going to be gone. Like Transformers, I think, uh, is has negotiated IMAX uh, for next week. And then the following is Flash and Flash will be in IMAX until Indiana Jones gets there. And then, you know, Indy gets IMAX until Mission and then Mission gets it until Oppenheimer. Like if you want to see it in the premium format and truly, I think a movie like across the spider verse deserves to be seen in the IMAX format. I honestly think with flash as well too. flash is a movie you're going to want to see in the IMAX format. You have a, such a limited amount of time when you need to get to these movies to see them that way. And we were talking specifically about mission being the one that feels like it's being sandwiched in a really difficult spot because it has Oppenheimer right behind it. And Nolan from what I understand, has a three week exclusivity, you know, when he hits because he has such a great deal with IMAX. So missions theoretically going to get one week in IMAX before it has to move to regular screens. And that's a significant because I bought IMAX tickets for across the Spider-Verse for my family and I don't buy a lot of movie tickets because I'm lucky enough to be able to get to go to screenings. And I was like, hot damn, (laughs) this is a lot of money to pay for IMAX tickets. But it's that counts a lot to the box office. So I don't this seems like a weird problem that Hollywood wanted to 
stockpile all of their movies in June and July because August seems thin to me. Well, so, I mean, honestly, doesn't does May seem kind of thin? Like, well, we had Guardians, Fast, and Little Mermaid. Yeah. Just basically in May. And then all of a sudden within like a... 12 to 14 day period you have indie mission barbie and oppenheimer like did no one i mean did everyone think that the other studio was going to blink i guess yeah i guess i'm not quite sure because they are all like you say they're going after the same audiences yeah you know that's not counter programming necessarily even barbie and oppenheimer it's not counter programming because barbie's not a straight up kids movie it's it's more uh satire aimed at adults And, and a lot of the audience excited for mission is the same audience that's excited for oppenheimer Yes, 100%. Do well, we know it, Mission has always been known to be a series that doesn't open huge, opens in the ballpark of 60, but it has mm-hmm. legs. Like that's always been Mission's appeals that it doesn't have to be a massive, insane record breaking opening because it'll make its money in the weeks to come. But if in the weeks to come, you've got Barbie and Oppenheimer and potentially Indy still chugging along, if it's, I'm more concerned about the weeks to come on Mission than I am the opening. Now, I do think that's why they bumped it up a few days to the to 12th. Wednesday. Yeah, to yeah. Wednesday, um, because I think they're less concerned with what those that three day opening is. And they'll report it as the five day opening. Does but, Mission I mean, have a different rollout internationally? Does it open I a little bit later in some of the other markets? I wonder. I bet Gabe knows the answer to that question in approximately 90 seconds. <laughs> I'll, I'll look. <laughs> All right. While he's looking into that, um, do we want to guess Spider-Verse projections? I'm going to guess an even 100. I feel like okay. that's a nice, sweet number. And and I, oh, I even guessing that makes me feel like I'm underestimating it a little bit. Uh, I, I hope that it's 115 or higher. Hell, I hope it is very high. Um, you know what? It's not a three day weekend. What do you mean? A four day weekend. A four day oh. weekend. It's oh, not okay. a holiday. Like if it would have been Memorial Day, I would have said 100 million easily. Sure. But uh, Kev, what do you think? Uh, I'm going to say 125. Hey, uh, let me get my prediction. I'm going to split the difference between you two and go with 115 million for uh, for Across the Spider-Verse. So Jake has 100 million, Kev 125. I'm at 115. Well, we shall see. We have plenty of box office numbers to track as the summer movie season rolls along. Uh, let's get to this week in movies where we have a couple of exciting things to talk about, including a new horror film called The Boogeyman. And if you listen to Real Blend on the regular, you will know that we had director Rob Savage come on the show. So here's our plug. Uh, to go back and find that we ran it last week because we knew we had so much Spider-Verse stuff to come to. Um, and Rob is a really good interview. He's a young guy who seems like he knows a ton about the movie industry. A lot of great references to uh, old films that were influential in terms of him making this. Uh, I went through that entire movie without realizing that the girl uh, who was the the older sister in it is the girl from Yellow Jackets, mm-hmm. who is the yeah. Juliette Lewis stand in for yeah. it. I don't know if she just looks different, but I never, never once picked up on it. And then somebody was like, oh, Sophie Thatcher from Yellow Jackets. And I was like, what? That was that I haven't was watched her. the second season. I've heard the second season's fantastic. It is very good. Yes, I like it a lot. It's still extremely twisted. And um, I don't know where that show is going, but I'm I'm kind of on board and willing to watch it. Um, I'll go with Boogeyman and, and, and I'll talk about the fact that I, I thought it was, uh, disappointing, um, because it was getting the kind of hype that like a barbarian got last year of like, Hey, this is an under the radar gem from a director you're probably not familiar with. And man, it's going to scare you, scare your pants off. Um, and I didn't find it. My, my biggest knock on is that I didn't, I never found it scary really. Um, I wanted to know a little bit about the lore of this boogeyman character, which is essentially a creature that I think feeds on grief um, and is able to. It's not like haunting a location. It has the ability to move from person to person. um, And there's two different main families that it follows who have had tragedies in their lives. And I will leave those for you to discover if you should like to. Um, But I haven't seen some of the more recent things like Evil Dead Rises, and so I don't know what to compare it to. Um, But, you know, I was looking for a really good sort of get underneath your skin, even a even a safe jump scare every once in a while. And I kind of found this one to just be mediocre. And I I don't know if you guys are higher on it than I am or not. Jake, you're a resident horror guy. Where'd you fall on it? Um, I thought it was fine. Um, It kind of reminded me of a a better than average version of something that would have come out around 2003, 2004, 2005, um, including there was one called Boogeyman, which I believe came out around around that time. Um, you know, I thought that there were some really interesting uh, 
in imagery and some really interesting moments that that showed sort of the flashes of genius from Rob Savage that that I feel like we saw a lot of with Host, um, particularly involving um, a young girl in a glowing orb that she rolls under the bed. Uh, it's in the trailer, but I thought mm-hmm. that was a really I thought that was a really great moment. A handful of moments like that, one with a flashing red light um, involving a therapist in, in mm-hmm. a room. Um, so there are those moments where I was like, yes, like, OK, you're 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 almost there. Like, give me give me a handful more moments like that. But unfortunately, uh, for every one of those flashes of brilliance, I felt like we were then bogged under another 20 minutes of like not much going on. Um, you also have to keep in mind it's based on a short story that is, is essentially the, the story can be told in one scene in the film. Like one scene in the movie is the short story. So there's not a lot of source material there to, to go off of whenever it says based on the short story by Stephen King. It's not based on the short story like by Stephen King in the way that Stand By Me was based on the body or Shawshank was based on Shawshank or The Mist was based on The Mist. It's really just literally the entire short story is one room, two people talking in one room. So, it, you know, it was stretched thin to say the least. Uh, you know, I, I did appreciate seeing you know less of the monster and you know it as as happens in these sort of situations the more and more we saw it the, the less and less scary i found it to be um i walked away thinking it, it was fine it didn't it does make me think less of of rob savage but as uh, kevin often says necessity is the mother of invention and maybe he's a director that thrives under not having uh, as many resources as he was clearly given uh, to make this one because you liked host the movie Love that he directed it was, prior it was, to this. It was uh, on my top 10. Uh, it, honestly, it's one of the all-time scariest films I've ever seen in my entire life. Interesting. Did okay. you see... I don't think this was an R interview. I think this was a, a separate Q&A thing, but sometimes they blur. Uh, the story about the glowing orb, no. Jake, and what it was originally supposed to be? No. It was originally she was going to have a lightsaber that that was glowing and then disney was like she played leia in our star wars series we need to change that and so it was like it was like two weeks before they had to rewrite a lot of the scares to to this ball um i don't think it was ours maybe it was our uh cb interview i forget where he was saying he's probably saying it all over the place but a hilarious coincidence that they cast that's wild young and princess leia and because it's a disney film it, it's, it's a disney film disney, and, but they, yeah they but just, they also were like let's not cross that's fantastic have imagery of of yeah. young princess leia with a toy lightsaber you know in a major movie <laughs> uh kev how about you where'd you fall yeah i wasn't a huge massive fan of this one i i found I found the scares and the storyline to just be very familiar. It didn't do anything new for the genre, at least in my opinion. There were some cool shots, some interesting ways to use lighting. I thought that the Sawyer character was fascinating in the way that 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 light up ball was used to light room and use it. It was a clever way to play with that. And it did bring me back to the concept of you know, being scared as a kid, checking under my bed, all those things played in. There was just dialogue in this film that I found to be, it's weird because I'm not trying to sit here and be nitpicky about realism because we're dealing with a movie about the boogeyman, but there's a grounded nature I find in horror films sometimes that even in the supernatural aspect of things, like there, there has to be a level, in my opinion, of realism with the dialogue. Like when I watch The Shining, I know that can't happen, but I also know that, the way people the shining have to behave the way people would behave in that situation. Right. I, I, I agree with you. I hate whenever people are like, well, dude, it's a movie about monsters. It's like, OK, sure. But right. people still need to behave like humans. Like that's what right. makes these fantastical situations. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, I agree. No, 100%. no. That's why I like, you know, like films like Sinister, films that generally deal with horrific supernatural situations. What makes them really interesting is when the grounded aspect of the realism of the dialogue and the family and, and the drama that lead into it. The dialogue in this film, just some of it made me laugh. Some of it took me out of the movie, whether it was tension, intentional or not. Um, I also found I you know I, I just found the film not to be memorable. Like it, it just didn't do anything new. Like with Smile and the Black Phone, these were all films that while they had familiar things with them, they were still doing new things that made me that scared me in a way that I hadn't seen in horror before. Even even like Evil Dead Rise, even though it's like the fifth Evil Dead film or whatever that would be, it still pushed the limits. It still found ways to terrify me and and relentless, brutal horror does that really well. Um, After seeing Evil Dead Rise and then seeing this, it, it, it did feel like 
I was watching like a more of a kid friendly horror movie, which is, you know, again, I have no problem with PG-13. Some of the scariest movies I've ever seen are PG-13. The Sixth Sense is one of the scariest movies I've ever seen. That's PG-13. You can do PG-13 horror. It doesn't it, it works. I mean, Poltergeist is PG. Jaws, if you consider it a horror movie, is PG. I mean, there's lots of movies that have dealt with ratings. It's nothing to do with the PG-13 because you can get around that. I mean, The Dark Knight, well, for example. You. Just on, mem- on memorable, movie, yeah. memorable sequences like like I, I think that there are better horror sequences in something like the Pope's Exorcist. Right. Like, I remember some of those scenes now still to this day. But if you ask me specific things that happened in in this film, I just don't I can't come up with any, to be honest with you. I think you're right where you, when you called it forgettable and just sort of like not. Yeah, not very memorable. It's just it's just something like I will say, like, there's a really cool sequence in the beginning that I thought was interesting. Um, and I thought David Desmachian's character had promise. And, and there's I won't go into specific details, but there's just a lot of things. The way Jake, the, the, the therapy room. Yeah, that's yeah. a short story that yeah, see, yeah, Jake yeah. described the short story to me, which apparently and I'm sorry if you already said this, but that to me sounds way more interesting than mm-hmm. the, like when Jake explained that to me, I said to myself, why isn't that the movie? And I think one of the things that they may have underestimated here is, and again, I don't know the exact decision making process of what happened behind the scenes. I think they made it PG 13 because the story is about kids and they're being scared of under their bed. So they wanted to hit a broader audience. But you look at the box office numbers for smile and evil dead rise and the black phone, which all made over a hundred million dollars. I don't think this will make over a hundred million dollars. And because one, I don't find it to be as scary um, or as original. And two, I think an R rating in horror actually makes it more appealing nowadays. And I think while growing up, PG-13. I think that's the audience that's buying the tickets. True. And, but, but, but Smile, for example, I went and saw Smile on a, uh, like a, a Thursday afternoon. It was all high school kids, you know, in, in the movies. And because think about it when you were growing up. R rated was way more appealing. There was oh, something yeah. about like it made it it made it like taboo and, and or like all, and also like we're taking you know, we're serious now. We're like we're being taken seriously as a horror yeah. audience and and the you're, movie is taking itself seriously. You're about to see some stuff. Like you're about to see some scary stuff. So I I actually think weirdly the PG-13 works against it. Uh, in this movie, yeah. in a weird way. And do we, did our, is it our show or one of the TV interviews that I did where he said the movie was PG-13 or was going to be R? It was he our told show. Us that. He told us right that. Right before he started two, filming. It was originally R up until two weeks before they started filming. That's right. He was on our show saying that. Here's that the thing, though. tells you something. But he said they didn't horror. change much. He said they didn't have to change much. Yeah, I thought I, this is the kind of project where I'm not sure the rating was going to help it one way or the other. It's just not weird enough. Like, I yeah. like weird horror. This is the safest horror you could ever imagine. You know, like even the crystal ball element, which is a fun bit visually. Like, who hasn't seen that, you know, a bazillion times to, you know, come back to a a cliche that we're using on the show often. Like it's just not memorable. It's not original. And it's, I don't know. I feel bad kicking this guy around because he seemed really nice on the show. He was a great interview. I do recommend it. He was a very good interview. And, you know, King adaptations have their highs and their lows, their peaks and their valleys. King works. I mean, the dude's been writing for over half because he wrote this story back in 1973. So like he wrote the story 50 years ago. So he's been yeah. writing for the, for more than half a century. And Sean, you've read enough Stephen King stuff to know that the man's got a very high ceiling, but also a very low floor. Oh like yeah. You know, so the fact, so like middle tier Stephen King, which I think this is, is fine. Like it's, 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 you know, it's not, you know, it, it's not Salem's law. It's not pet cemetery, but it's also, you know, it's not dream catcher. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. and I, the last thing I'll say about is this. An alien. The last thing I'll say about is, say about is this: there is some <laughs> interesting filmmaking in this film, and I do think that Rob Savage it will have a, a good career. I just, I don't think that this was a, a film that just it didn't scare me or or give memories enough for me to walk away from it and go, yeah, you should right. go see that. I wonder how his brother uh, Randy Savage, the wrestler, is doing. It's a great question. I was wondering the same thing. I don't know why we didn't ask that. Maybe next time we get him on. All right, let's throw it to a quick break. <laughs> and on the other side, him on. <laughs> the other side, uh, we're going to dive into Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. 
All right. But the big movie that everybody is going to want to go see in the theaters this week uh, is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, which uh, we've been talking about a lot already this week and we'll continue to next week. We'll remind you guys the next week's episode is going to have the three main directors uh, behind the show and we're going to save our spoiler conversation talk for next week's episode following their interview because we allowed them to speak openly uh, about spoilers and get into specifics about different scenes and so we're going to we're going to save all of our conversation about that uh for next week so this is just our gut reaction to spider-man and um i'm gonna let jake go first because i think he's tipped his hand a bit uh in the commercials that you might have seen (laughs) making the rounds of how he feels about this latest animated feature imagine Uh, he goes you know after some thought yeah Yeah. (laughs) not a fan to be honest with you jake you're pretty Uh, high on it yeah i'm very high on it i you know i remember when we all got out of uh, avengers endgame and all texted each other and I remember getting a text from Sean where I think you said something along the lines of that's one of the greatest films I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And I remember thinking like, damn, like I, I was really disappointed that, that you know, I, I famously did not feel that way about that movie. Um, and I, I often wonder like, man, when was the last time I walked out of a movie theater thinking that's one of the best movies I've ever seen in my life? And now mm-hmm. I can answer that question because I think this is it. Um, I... I don't want to say the word overwhelmed because there's a negative connotation that comes with that word. But like, I just found myself just kind of overwhelmed with the genius and the artistry of that movie. Um, the, the, the emotions that I felt I would put toe to toe with the, 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 the hardest, strongest emotions I've ever felt in a Pixar movie. Mm. Um, I think it is probably the most visually jaw dropping, awe inspiring animation I've ever seen in my life. Like it is pushed to me, the boundaries of what animation can be and what animation can do. Um, Sean, you said it perfectly that there, there isn't a moment or a frame that you could not, f- you know, f- you know, pause frame, hang above your fireplace or make the background of your, of your laptop or your, your the wallpaper of your phone. It's just, and it tackles so many interesting things. And one of the things that we all talked about, I mean, how serious an, an adult of a film it is. And I think it really emphasizes that point that Guillermo del Toro was driving home the whole uh, award season for Pinocchio, which is that like animation is cinema, like it's not for kids. And I think that this movie touches on a lot of themes of what it feels like to to, to be made to feel like a mistake, to mm-hmm. be made to feel like uh, you don't belong in, in a place that you so desperately want to belong to. Uh, you know, that's has to me always been one of the, the great appeals of Spider-Man is that while it is this big, fantastical fantasy of a boy swinging through the skies in New York after bit, being bitten by a spider, it should make at the end of the day, a good Spider-Man story should make you feel like short of being bit by a spider. That could be you. And I feel like this did the best job of doing that. Right. Um, so I'm just in awe of that. And just uh, without getting into spoilers, I loved the concept of canon being a plot point. Mm-hmm. I just it was one of those moments that I've never really thought about being used, utilized in a movie the way it was. And whenever it was brought up, I just went, you son of a bitch. Like, how has no one really brought up the idea of canon and because it's, it's a word that we all use so casually when yeah. describing everything, describing Star Wars or whatever the case may be. But making it a plot point, I thought was genius. So it's uh, so a absolutely brilliant screenplay, gorgeous, flawless animation. Like, I genuinely, truly believe it's my favorite animated movie of all time. I just I like I, I wish I could put it on like I legit I like asked my rep. I was like, I know this is stupid and I know the answer is no. And I know you're going to laugh at me, but can I get a link? Because I really just want to watch it over and over and over again. I really just want to put it on my TV and pr- I was like, I've seen it. I'm not going to give it to anybody. And she's like, yeah. and of course, the answer was no. But um, I just can't see. And I, I loved the first one. The first one was on my top 10 list at the end of the year. Love the first one. But as Sean beautifully put it when we all got out of the movie, this one makes the first one look like stick figures. And, and really I does. feel bad saying that because but I, I, but even going back and one. watching clips of the first one, like I'm still like, oh, this looks incredible. The into the Spider-Verse still looks incredible. 
for what it was doing for animation at that time, which is five years ago, which is a, a lifetime in terms sure. of of animation improving and the tools coming at it. But it's not even just that. It's just their approach. It's their yeah. approach to animation and the way that they use color schemes inside of scenes to reflect emotions mm. and how each of the different multiverses that you um, either travel into or just even peek into will have such a distinct Look, and it's not too dissimilar to if you read a character over the course of, you know, multiple issues in a title, you'll get different artists who come in and out. And sometimes it can be really jarring when you've been reading, um, you know, or, or enjoying the ink done by one artist for 10 issues and then they shift to another person for for two issues and you might not like the style quite as much. Right. And you're just like, ah, I still love this character, but I don't really love the way it's looking on screen. But I freaking loved every single thing that we saw in Spider-Verse. And that's why I think that the spot was such a terrific villain as a way to sort of create a portal. You know what it means into these other universes. I also just thought he was really funny. I thought Jason Schwartzman was terrific in terms of his his delivery. I thought the entire cast was great in terms of their delivery. Oscar Isaac gets some really great lines. Uh, Shamik Moore is still great. Haley Seinfeld is still great. Jake Johnson gets less to do in this one. He's not quite the full mentor uh, character, but um, the stuff with, with Miles' parents I thought was fantastic. Um, there's some really, really, really beautiful uh, elements in here of a parent having to accept the fact that your kid is uh, getting older and moving on. And I think that they touch that stuff beautifully kevin brought it up i think you brought up with lord and miller about the 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 line from the mom of like hey yeah, yeah. uh there's a little boy inside of you who is always going to be mm -hmm. um this this little boy and and uh you know i have a, a 19 year old and a 15 year old and i still call them like our baby like brendan's baby boy and 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 pj's you know little boy and and they're always good that's how i will see them for the rest of my life and so uh you know, these things just hit home in a way. But like, in addition to that, the action is is remarkable. Uh, it moves with the physicality and the physics that that you can do with Spider-Man only in animation. And I think because of animation and because of the way that they're able to sort of rapidly transition between the different multiverses. This one movie has done more to further the concept of multiverse storytelling than anything being done by Marvel or DC in live action. And I can't fault those guys because live action multiverse is just really difficult. You have to get John Krasinski to agree to play Reed Richards, you know, for a couple of scenes in Dr. Strange, or you need well, Michael uh, Keaton to uh, let, commit let me to the bit. Something. Yeah. I, I, I want to push back on that concept a little bit whenever people say, well, it's so much easier to do in animation than it is in live action. Right. I get the concept of, yeah, it's harder to get different actors to, but like, when 90% of these Marvel movies these days are shot in front of a green screen and so yeah. much of it is CGI, isn't that just a different form of animation? Like, is it that much harder to do it? In, short of, yeah, it's tough to get Michael Keaton back. So, like, yeah, I get the whole concept of, like, bringing back that, you know. But in terms of just representing the multiverse i mean that was always my biggest knock about dr strange was that like yeah. the craziest thing they could come up with is that you cross the street on green and you <laughs> stop like that was like uh, the, the, the mind went nuts and that was a crazy like i'm sorry like that's it's it's not that much harder when uh, so much of these live action movies are cgi it's just a different style of animation they just don't have as good of ideas as phil lord and chris miller do and i think that that i think it's people sort of being a bit reductive by saying that because I think what they're trying to say or what they mean is that live action is handcuffed to realism and if you're off by 10% from realism you get criticized for not looking real okay Whereas, that's, that's and, and, and it's, again okay. it's not about easier because I think easier I think again I think sure. it's, re it's reducing animation down to like oh you just just throw some splashy cut like sure I think it's taking away from the art form especially of something like like a spider-verse but I think what they're getting at at the core is being handcuffed to realism and how you have to nail it or you don't that's versus fair. I, living I, in I, a style can I give one quick example um, and sure. this is something that everybody has seen in the trailers it's not giving anything away but there's a moment where Miles steps into what is the lobby of the multiverse and you're able to see let's say roughly 50 to 75 different spider-men you know who are costumed in incredibly different ways right 
Try to recreate that exact scene in live action and you need extras and costumes and you need, you know, this is all stuff that like costs a lot but of money I, and takes a lot of time. in Marvel fashion, all of those, all of those Spider-Man would be CGI. Mm, uh, true. Okay. All right. I see. All right. I see your point. I see. But now I, see I also get Gabe's point about it needing to be had because there are moments in this film where you know this character from this multiverse is in the same scene as this character from this multiverse and because it's animation their animation styles can look completely different sure and our brain accepts it to Gabe's point because it's animation so yes I do I do I, I do agree with that but I also would like to remind you that eh, you know they, they don't even shoot Spider-Man movies in New York anymore so it's all it's all it's all CGI it's all CGI it's all it's all some form it's a, of it's computer Atlanta. Jake, did it's you know Atlanta. they shot they shot Batman in Chicago? Did you know that, Jake? No, I live in Gotham City. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Jake is Batman, by the way. Just a of significantly less money. <laughs> um, hmm. So my opinion is that it is, it is the best Spider-Man movie ever made. Jake, are you saying that as well, too? hundred percent. It is. It is my favorite Spider-Man movie ever. Kevin, that, your and, and, favorite and Sam Raimi Spider-Man 2. Kev, your favorite of all time or uh, third favorite, third favorite. OK, interesting. Yeah. So where do you fall yeah. on it? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a masterpiece. It's uh, one of the best superhero films I've ever seen. Uh, I, I do want to and, and this might be controversial. I do want to mention this. It is a film that is a, a first part of a story. I just I, I, I want people to understand this. And Phil and Chris talked about it in the interview. I get that the movie's called Across the Spider-Verse. The next one's called Beyond the Spider-Verse. From what I understand, originally it was a part one, part two. Um, I, as I sat in the theater, did not know that that the film was going to end where it ended. Um, for me, it feels like it is not a finished, complete story. That doesn't take away from the movie itself because the movie itself is absolutely incredible. Um, but there's a lot of story left to happen that they build up in this story. And then and it's just, you know, that that's the nature of how films work when you make them, you know, in, you know, you make them in order. You go, you have the first part, second part, third part, Lord of the Rings part, you know, Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers and Return of the King. It happens all the time. I think that going into this film, I did not know or remember or have enough knowledge of that this was going to be uh, in my opinion, half a story. And I don't know if you guys agree with me on that. That's what it feels like. Um, in terms of the film itself, looking at this film as itself, it is incredible on every level. Visually, the sound design is absurd. Uh, and Pemberton, when you hear our Daniel Pemberton interview, you're going to hear a lot of how his score work is all part of the sound design as well. Little things you're hearing in the film that you might not think of as music are coming from him and his, and his ideas. Obviously, there's sound effects and sound design that is being done as well, but that's all married together. The way Pemberton's score works with the soundtrack is incredible. Um, there's a there's a way the film moves and breathes musically that I find beautiful. And the beginning of the film is literally you know, a drumming sequence, as we were talking about earlier. Right, Sean? It's, you know, mm -hmm. the band sequence. So um, I want to point out a few things that I think are really strong in this movie. Uh, the voice performances from everybody involved are outstanding. The one that I can't stop thinking about is Oscar Isaac. Mm. I thought Oscar 100%. Isaac's performance in this film was one of his best performances of his career. Um, it's a great performance. It's a great character. He this character is it Miguel O'Hara. Um, the mm -hmm. character has such a weight to him emotionally and kind of, in my opinion, grounds the whole film. I really think that his character is the centerpiece, the grounding. And because Miles the Miles character is so amazing. He's obviously the lead and Shamik Moore is brilliant, but he's a kid. You know, he's 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 a, he's a kid in high school. So he is dealing with all of these things, quote unquote, saving the world, the multiverse. But also I'm grounded by my parents because I haven't been going to class kind of thing. And so he's just it, it's so all over the place. But that's the point of it. That's what what would happen for a teenager to be given this information and have this weight of the world on their soul, shoulders. For me, the Oscar Isaac character kind of is the 
is the reality point of it. He understands the scope of everything. He understands the emotions of what Miles is dealing with. And Miles does not fully understand what he's dealing with. That's kind of the whole concept of the movie, in my opinion. And so I got to give Oscar Isaac credit because his performance is unbelievable. It, it, it's, it's amazing. Haley Steinfeld and Shamik Moore are outstanding. Incredible chemistry, incredible sequences, beautiful voice work. Um, I know we got to move on, but I, I, I love this movie from visual to emotions to score music. When I say it's my third favorite, I always Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2 is my ultimate. It just will always be. I know this is going to be a hot take. I love Far From Home. I'm sorry. I just do. Um, I'm obsessed with Far From Home. Far From Home? Far From Home is my second favorite Spider-Man movie. Interesting. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because, and the reason, and and I I don't care, and people can give me crap for that. What I loved about Spider-Man Far From Home was the filmmaking vibe of it. I mean, essentially, Jake Gyllenhaal's character is a filmmaker. And and, and that just kind of struck me in a very interesting way. Uh, This is my number three Spider-Man film of all time. And I'm talking about they're following two of my favorite Spider-Man movies of ever. And this is definitely right there. Um, I love this movie. It is outstanding. The word masterpiece gets thrown around a lot. It is a masterpiece. Um, But I just want to warn people. This this is, in my opinion, it's a half a movie. Okay, we will debate this Should, next week when more people have seen yeah. it. Yeah, yes. but Jake and Sean, you guys, I'm not that far off. It's not a full movie. It's not. I, I mean, disagree. I, I, this I disagree. Is, I, disagree. I think this I, is probably perfect for our spoiler discussion that we're sure. have next week. <laughs> this episode is all things Spider Man, which I will never complain about. But the blend game is going to be hashtag Spidey Blend, uh, and from that perspective, we are doing favorite moments from a Spider Man movie. Um, and that can include Into the Spider-Verse or even Across the Spider-Verse if you want it to. Uh, Jake Hamilton, what is your all-time favorite moment from one of the Spider-Man movies? I'm curious to if anyone has the same one as me. Uh, mine is uh, Mr. Stark, I Don't Feel So Good. Um, nope. I just... That I mean, it, look, uh, that's Infinity War, though. Yeah, Infinity War. It's not from like Spider-Man, but it's still a Spider-Man it moment. Still a Spider-Man moment. Oh, and, okay. and just, I mean... The thing I always love, I was just saying, what I love about Spider-Man is at the end of the day, he's sway, he's bit by a radioactive spider. He's taking on these wild, crazy, insane villains and there's symbiotes and there's this and this and this. At the end of the day, he is a kid in high school. Mm-hmm. And that is what makes Spider-Man such a great character is that at the end of the day, he's still he's brave, but he still gets scared. He, you know, he's still, you know, he, he'll he, he will sacrifice anything to save people, but he still has a crush on the girl in class like he's still a kid and that moment when he is like being this big brave superhero but all of a sudden he realizes he's about to die and he's going to his hero who has kind of been this father figure of him and him him sort of like in the most in a brilliant performance by tom holland saying i don't want to go i don't want to go i don't want to go like as as I'm getting chills talking, literally getting chills talking about as Tony Stark is like trying to like helplessly trying to save him. This this kid who like he kind of was trying to protect. He wanted to give everything to protect from the, from a moment like this uh, as he's turning to dust. And keep in mind, they don't know that this is happening everywhere else in the universe at the same mm-hmm. time. They don't really understand this moment. All he knows is that this kid who trusted him with everything is dying and he's scared and there's nothing he can do about it. And it Tony's is. very first line when he steps off the ship in Avengers Endgame and he says to Cap, the very first thing he says to him was, I lost the kid. Lost the kid. Yeah. Yep. And I just think, I think the tragedy of that moment. Uh, I chills just, by you saying that, Sean. Right. I just want you to know. Yeah. Like, I started to t- <laughs> well yeah. up. I was right? like, oh yeah, that really does the hit. Like, that's oh. the, the, the tragedy yep. of, oh. of that moment. Tom Holland's brilliant performance in that moment. Uh, to me, those emotions don't work unless they reinforce what the character of Spider-Man is about. Mm-hmm. And the reason that character works is because it reminded us, holy shit, he's a kid. And yep. that's why I love that moment. Beautiful. Kev, where'd you go? I, it's funny. There's a lot of them. But the one that I think about the most emotionally is in Homecoming when he's in the car with Keaton. Ah, great choice. Ah, great I love that choice. Scene. That great, scene great choice. Blew my mind. Look at Tom Holland getting all the picks. <laughs> Man, I, I like. It's so funny because I don't, I don't necessarily love Homecoming, but 
that's my that's probably the scene that I remember just my jaw dropping. It's a really great twist that most people still claim they didn't see coming. I, I do. Uh, I, I remember because um, I didn't do the junket, so I saw it opening night. Uh, I remember being in that opening night. It, it might have been a Thursday night audience packed. And I remember like that, the, the audible collective body of the audience kind yeah. of like the air just being sucked out of the room. And it's so obvious, too. Oh, but yet- it's so obvious when you <laughs> think that I, I felt st- it was one of those things. I was like, am I stupid for not seeing that yeah, coming? Yeah. I know that was so. But I love that I didn't see it coming. Like, I love like I, I'm not good at, at at figuring out twists in advance, mm-hmm. um, which I, I take as as, as a positive for someone who does what i do um but uh but i just was just blown away. that's kevin that's a great pick when, when right. he said i see dead people jake went what does he mean by that <laughs> <laughs> define de- what is this movie yeah what are they wait did i need to see the first two fifth senses to understand what's going yeah. on <laughs> <laughs> um i have uh three i'm gonna rattle through no, really quickly one. you get one, one. um I did oh, not choose a whole book about this, Sean. <laughs> Pick one. I did Jesus. not. I did not choose him being buried underneath the rubble in Homecoming, um, which is a terrific scene. It's a great one. Uh, it doesn't he like? Doesn't he scream help? Yes, he does. Oh. Isn't, isn't yeah. that a frame ripped right from from one of the comics? So it's uh, Amazing Spider-Man thirty three. It's called the final chapter, and yeah. he's buried underneath this rubble, or uh, and he has to get to this serum in order to save uh, Aunt May, who is dying, and he has to come up with the willpower and the strength to lift this thing up off of him, this impossible uh, weight, and it goes to show that Spider-Man just can't. He cannot quit. He's not allowed to quit. Essentially, uh, and when that happened, when that moment happened in Homecoming. I was in New York attending the junket and it's he was buried underneath the rubble and you could see the way he was pinned. And I edged to the edge of my seat and I said, are they going to do this? Are they about to do the final chapter? And then he does it. He gets underneath it and he lifts it. And I was just like in heaven, basically. Um, But I didn't pick that one. Uh, I am going with the moment in Spider-Man No Way Home where the three guys get together uh, after getting their asses kicked and they realize they have to work together as a team and the whole uh, Peter one, Peter two, Peter three. And then they go running off and the three of them swing together and land on their majestic Spider-Man um, poses. And it's fantastic because as they are up in the air and getting ready to land, if you've never noticed this, um, the poses that they strike while they are in the air with the moon backlighting them are the poses that are available on their DVD covers uh, that are distinct to each of the to, one to Toby, one to Andrew and one to Tom. And uh, I just think that that little bit with the chemistry when Holland's like, uh, I don't mean to brag, but I was in the Avengers and they don't know what the Avengers are kind of thing. Is that a band? Then, Is that a band? Oh, my gosh. You in a band? And then Andrew's delivery of Peter three, I think, honestly, should have got him a Peter three. Uh, should have got him. A, <laughs> should have got him an Oscar because it's just outstanding. So I went with that pick um, audience picks. Danny Thill said uh, Peter saving MJ and no way home. So that's Garfield's Peter mm-hmm. uh, and Peter telling May he was there with Uncle Ben in Spider-Man 2. OK, that's a tough one. Uh, Damien McDonald says the first time I saw him on the big screen in Spider-Man 2002, I was in awe. Jose Munez says no way homes. Is that a band? Are you in a band? Moment band of confusion band. from Garfield's mm. Peter Parker. Uh, Zen Jake says Miles becoming Spider-Man and his leap from the building and into the oh, Spider-Verse. What's up, Danger? Tremendous. I thought about that. I thought about what's up, Danger. It's a great one. And the, my favorite part about that moment is that when that's when Miles gets his comic book, his comic book yeah. lands on top of the pile and he's officially a Spider-Man. Yeah. Oh, God, Sean, I, I have a question see. for you. Yeah. Who's your favorite Aunt May? Rosemary Harris. Me too. Yeah. Why, why is that? Why is she our favorite? Because she's the closest to comic book adaptation. Um, I don't mind Sally Field. I don't. I don't think Sally Field got used the right way. But mm-hmm. Sally Field and Martin. Um, ba, 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 who? Martin, Martin Sheen. Sheen. Thank you. Um, were a good pair, but she's not a good Aunt May. Rosemary Harris was just the perfect amount of of a uh, old, delicate Aunt mm-hmm. May. And then Tomei, I don't know what Tomei is. I don't know. Or was doing, I guess, at this point. Uh, And David Hammer says, my favorite Spider-Man moment after a lot of contemplation is when Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man stops Tom's Spider-Man from killing Green Goblin in No Way Home. It was just such a powerful moment. And I thought it was great that Tobey got to be the real hero of that moment. So, ooh, can I pick one more? Sure. 
uh, when Toby and uh, Alfred Molina are reunited in No Way Home. Ah, that's a good one, too. And he says, uh, you know, how you been? And he goes, I'm I'm trying to be better. Trying to do better. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and, ju- and just just the way and, and it shows how good of an actor Alfred Molina is that he was able to snap back into it. But the way that he snaps back into how uh, Otto Octavius spoke to Peter before he became Doc Ock, like that very mm-hmm. gentle, almost father like, like I think he even calls him my boy. Like, how are you, my boy or something yeah. like that? Yep. Um, I loved, loved, loved. That, that is moment. one of my favorite scenes from Spider-Man 2 is when the two of them are sitting around uh, just discussing mm-hmm. science. You yeah. know, once because first he's annoyed to have to sit with Peter because Harry mm-hmm. Osborne sort of pulls strings to get him to, to yeah. sit down for this lunch. And then uh, Otto realizes how smart Peter is and and then he introduces Dude, I have him shit to, to Rosie. Do this You're making me want to sit down and rewatch all these, these Spider-Man movies. <laughs> hey, listen, I've lived with them for years upon years. So thank you, everybody who participated in Great Spidey picks. Blend this week. Great picks. Uh, for next week, Gabe, we have some uh, some changes to get into. This is what we were teasing earlier in the show. So I've got some some update news, big update news, but not, you know, let's not get too crazy. Uh, it's a little bittersweet. Ultimately, it is exciting, I think, because the four of us are all very excited about what this means. But for next week's blend game, blend game, we are not uh, having a blend game. Uh, and that is because moving forward, starting next week, we are going to shift the format of the show a little bit. It's still going to feel like the show. The show is not changing in the sense that uh, we're going to be doing anything terribly different, um, pr- particularly in the way that we present ourselves and talk about things, because I don't think we could ever help that. Um, but a lot of these updates are all looking at streamlining the show a little bit, spending more time on uh, segments that we're more passionate about um, and introducing some more fun, exciting segments into the mix. Um, so I'm going to give give sort of a blanket update of sort of where that's headed. And then I'd love to hear your guys' feedback if you want to email me realblend at cinemablend.com. But one of those things is we are going to we're no longer going to do the blend game in the show. Um, but there may be a version of that that can still live on social right in if it's something you guys still want to keep doing. Um, and that's going to just give us more time to do to do other things and to, you know, spend more time in our reviews, do more spoiler segments uh, and things like that. The other big thing that is happening is that Monday's premium episode is going to be our last premium episode. We're recording it right after this and we're going to try to make it extra special for everyone who... Um, subscribes to that and pays for that uh i'm gonna do this sort of chat a little bit again at the start of that episode in case you're you're missing this now um but just letting you know that 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 is happening so we're 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 no longer going to do the premium segment we're no longer going to do things like the blend game and then starting next week you'll see a bit of of a change in the way that we we format the show after our interviews but all of this is in in support of of having more fun on the show doing more of what we do on the premium in our show um, and, and none of it is going to change the way that we do interviews necessarily. Um, and hopefully is all going to help support doing bigger, better, better interviews. Um, I do want to quickly say here, I'll say more in the premium feed, but if you pay for premium, um, we're still going to offer it. It's still going to be $5 a month. You're still going to get a newsletter and you're still going to get an ad free version of the show. We're just not going to have that extra segment. If you want to cancel that because you were in for the extra segment, totally understand no hard feelings. You're still a real one and that won't change. Um, that's just as it, the price itself is not going to change, even though we are technically giving you less, uh, just because that's, that's as low as we can justify it, um, for the ad free, which is the, which is the, the main benefit of that. So that is the rigmarole. I don't think I've forgotten anything, guys. If you guys want to say your two cents about, uh, I know you guys have been excited about some of the plans that we have, some of the ideas that we have, and, and just the idea of, um, being a little bit more relaxed after our interviews and doing doing some fun stuff, getting some yeah. more behind the scenes, you know? Well, you know, I think, you know, the, for the four of us um, hopped on a call to give you a little bit of behind the scenes in terms of what was going on, um, just to kind of discuss what was going on with the show. And and one of the really interesting things that, that I was thinking in my head as the discussion was happening that everyone individually brought up uh, to kind of show that we were all on the same page is for the, anyone who is listening that subscribes to premium, there are so many moments that we would get done recording a premium episode and just just keep laughing at a joke that was made or just kind of within the days to come talk about some something that happened at premium that that we just couldn't let go of that was so fun or that we got so passionate about it and 
you know, we I think we all sort of agree that that's kind of what the show should be. That 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 passion and that sort of off the cuff enthusiasm um, should should be there. Um, and so I really do think for you know I think we have a really passionate fan base of people that that like sort of that unstructured madness of the premium episode. And to some degree, I would say obviously it's not going to be a copy paste. But I think a lot of the vibe of that, the freedom of that is going to be brought over. So I would argue, Gabe, and you correct me if I'm wrong, a little bit less structure, a little bit more chaos, but all still still good mix. Yeah, 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 good, yeah. a good mix of the two. I think Splitting a good way to, to think about it. Um, and, you know, over the course of the next few weeks, as we're as we're putting those shows together, I want to hear your guys' feedback about things that we introduce that you like or, or don't like. I think the biggest change that you'll see is sort of trying to hit everything that's coming out this week. Um, you know, if you're, if you're listening this long and you're interested in this behind the scenes stuff that I'm going way too more, more into detail than you need, rather than us trying to be, you know, a one-stop shop for like, here's everything coming this week. And here's, here are our thoughts on everything. Focus more on the things that we're actually passionate about and spend more time with those Mm -hmm. um, things that you're passionate about at home too. you know, keep writing in and saying, I want to hear you guys talk about this because that'll motivate us to talk about it or to check Mm -hmm. it out. Um, You know, I don't want I don't want anyone at home to think that we're cutting out the audience uh, in the participation. We're hoping to get more of that. We're hoping to sort of foster more of that. Um, Yeah. So it should be fun. I also want to emphasize that I held out for more speaking parts. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and and a larger trailer as well too backstage so how'd yeah. that work out for you not too great <laughs> not too great yeah yeah so that's that's pretty much it i think we're, we're all excited sorry kevin if, if you wanted to add more i know you're no you're excited you guys said well. you guys said everything yeah you guys um, are great it was great but yeah appreciate you guys as always at home i think this is going to be really fun i think as you know things are picking up with the summer it's going to give us a lot of really cool opportunities to do stuff a little differently um, again, the reason I, we kept this at the end is because, uh, you know, I, this feels like a big announcement and maybe some of you are really upset about the blend game and the premium stuff. And I want to hear your, your feedback, of course. Um, but hopefully give us some time. If you, if you feel upset, I don't think anyone's going to feel upset, but if something made you upset, give us time to, to, you know, put a few more of these out. So you see that, you know, we're still real blend. We're still going to, oh yeah, still going to feel like us and more so probably, um, than before with, with, with what we're going to do. So. Thank more you all personal, for listening. More as personal always. stories as well, too. More personal yeah. stories from the road and more uh, insights into the There's, cool there's one this month that could be really cool. cool. I don't want to keep hyping it up because two this month. Oh, that's true. Two this month. There's some fun stories to be had coming up. We shall see. All right. Anyway. Yeah. On to that. So one more premium episode. And it's going to be yeah. a Spider-Man. Spider-Man focused IMDB game. So check yeah. the description below for how you can... Uh, Tune in for that, essentially. And in the mm-hmm. meantime, we'll be back next week. At Jake's Takes. Hammer. Wait, I gotta give the media socials. At Kev McCarthy TV. At Gabe Kovach. At Sean O'Connell underscore Sean underscore O'Connell. And the show is at Cinema Blend. Until then. Oppenheimer. Thank you, Kevin. There we Larry go. Larry Crown. <laughs> Barbie. <laughs>